One day I was in town and um, got back, the phone rang, said, you're interested in going to Germany? And I said, whoa, I didn't know about that. She said, well, British War Crimes Commission is looking for secretarial types. So then we got a captain who came to meet us at Victoria Street and came with, accompanied us across the channel. And uh, we went across and then on a train to Paris and they put us in this gorgeous hotel, you know, with this sort of red velvet curtains. Came and picked us up the next morning. We got on a train from Paris to uh, Frankfurt. Uh, got back in the car and they drove us from Frankfurt to uh, Nuremberg, to the Grand Hotel, mm -hmm. opposite. The, and uh, we were put in the third or fourth floor, I think. Mm -hmm. And we had to walk on a narrow board to get to our room. I suspect you've heard of that. Uh, and uh, we had a, a nail on the back of the door to put our clothes. Mm -hmm. We had two GI beds. When did you come to Nuremberg? What was the time period you first got? Sept October 1945. Okay. So you, were, you got the into Nuremberg just before the first trial got started. Right. Uh, I don't, I'm not afraid of saying it, we were top-notch. Yeah. We were always 90 words a minute. And uh, these weren't electric typewriters yeah. in those days, you know. When you first get to Nuremberg, the train comes in, you walk off the train and you look around, what's your impression of the city? Oh, I mean, it's just... I'd seen London, <laughs> but this yeah. was nothing compared to to what uh, that was because it was the the buildings were made of different stuff you know from the middle ages and they sort of crumbled and did you go to a lot of the trial itself did you go yeah I, I, whenever I could get out I'd get a pass and go in what do you think you walked in that first day and there's Gehring and Hess it was like a dream yeah I couldn't believe it I could almost Roger, reach out and touch him, I felt, you know. And I used to watch Goering. Every time a woman passed by or the court reporter or something, he'd look her up and down, you know. Real ladies' man. Yeah, yeah. Fat tick, he was. <laughs> Did you have a reaction as you looked down the dock and you saw Stryker? Or, um... they, they looked like nothing, just mm -hmm. like some somebody you'd see on the street, you know, without all their flashy uniforms and all that. They they looked like just, well, I can't say a laborer, but you, I think you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. you, you would never have, uh, you could never conceive that they would uh, get Im themselves involved in such heinous activities. Right. Amazing how people can get drawn in, I think. <coughs> I've always wondered how they could get drawn into this whole okay. scheme of things. Then I got onto those cases, the um, medical case, which is extremely interesting, with all the uh, experiments, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, one day my sister and I were talked, told to go over to the Bahnhof and meet two ladies off the train who had been incarcerated in a concentration camp. And uh, so they got off the train and one of them, she only had one bone in her lower leg, the other one had been destroyed. They had put... Um, shavings or something in the leg and they were doing a test I think for sulfur drugs. Here you are in October of 1945 you're assigned to the British uh, War Crimes Unit headed by uh, Harley Shawcross and David Maxwell Fife. Did you ever see the prosecutors themselves, the, the British prosecutors? Did you? 
Did your work interface with them? Yes, we used to go up to that castle. We used to go up there for parties and uh, I remember one evening we sat around with, uh, I think it was David Maxwell Fife, mm -hmm. and he went in the kitchen and made some sandwiches and <laughs> sat around there. The first thing I saw on the menu was a drink entitled the Niebergall. And I thought, hmm, somebody's... And then came this loud voice, oh, you know, and I thought, who the heck are you? And uh, it's probably covering up his shyness, but he found out who Fred Niebergall was, you know. So that's how you first laid that's eyes That's how on him. I laid eyes on him, yes. <laughs> and uh, Fred and I had a fight, which, and I threw this ring into the fountain. Oh, did you? Yeah, you're, oh yeah. we had the ring by then. And yeah, I said, the ring. I said, you could. And I threw it into the fountain, and so he rolled up his pants legs and climbed into the fountain. <laughs> um, and, uh, anyway, we got married on the 20th of September, 1947. Uh, now, he was chief of the document division. He ran um, about, uh, oh, I don't know, I've got it down somewhere. It's about a hundred Germans, six or seven or ten Americans, and he produced the daily proceedings mm. by eight o'clock the next morning. They were uh, numbered by P.S. and uh, that was Paris Story, P.S. for short. They sat down when they first got there and decided what, uh, what, how they were going to do it. And he would attest to the authenticity, so that was part of the... Yes, I have that authenticity on the internet. Uh, it's, on, it's on the uh, computer. I, Fred Nevergall, Lieutenant uh, 01167, yeah. uh, hereby certify that. And of course, when it all closed up, uh, he had the job of putting it all into the footlockers, getting it ready for shipment, and then they, that all came over to the archives here in Washington, D.C. What was his perspective? I don't think he ever really dis... He, he left all that German stuff behind, you know, in his youth right. of being a German. He, he dropped that, but he couldn't really take it out of his system. What did he think of it? Um, the way it was run, you mean? Mm -hmm. The way it was... I think he uh, did, thought they did a good job. They did the best they could. Some of the judges he thought were uh, shouldn't have been there, I don't think. You know this one? Sure, that's Kepner, Robert uh. Kepner. Fred and he were very friendly. Because did they, did they uh, speak German a lot to, them, to each other when they were... Oh, I don't know if they did. I don't think I was over there. Not in front of anybody, but they might have done in the office. I just thought, when the day is done, you've been there from 1945 to 1949. 49. You know, and you were sit back today and here we are, 2010. What did that mean to you? The great experience of my life. Of course, it... And it, it turned my life into a, a completely different direction, you know. I never thought of going to America. Mm -hmm. It didn't occur to me. Um, the whole new, new kind of... It was hard on me. When I look back, I often think to myself, you know, I gave up a lot to come here. I didn't know what I was in for. It wasn't just a job, it was the best experience of my life. I met some super people. I thought it was that justice had been done.